Welcome to the Trellix Spotlight series. My name is Nick and I will be your host. Today's session will focus on endpoint security for Linux, access protection, and exploit prevention best practices. This webinar will be recorded. If you prefer not to participate in the recorded session, please feel free to disconnect at this time. A link to today's recorded presentation will be emailed to all registered attendees. This webinar is a brief overview covering common use cases and scenarios regarding this topic. It is not intended to be all-encompassing. If assistance is needed, please contact Trellix Technical Support. If you have questions during the webinar, please type them in the Q&A window. This webinar may run longer or shorter based on your participation, and we recommend asking as many questions as you can to make the most of this series. If the Q&A window is not displayed, click the tab at the bottom of your session window and click on the Q&A icon. We will answer the questions during the final section of this webinar. If you experience any audio issues during the webcast, please drop and attempt to reconnect. Our first presenter today is Alwyn Manoharin. It has been a year since Alwyn joined Trellix. Previously, he was working with Concentrix supporting various Trellix products with both Windows and Linux platforms since 2015. Presently, his expertise is with the Trellix products for the Linux and Mac platforms. Our second presenter today is Hasib Mazid. Hasib has over four years of experience with Trellix products. He is currently supporting endpoint products for Linux and Mac environments. Ladies and gentlemen, Alwyn and Hasib. Thank you, Nick, for the wonderful introduction that you have provided. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's session. My name is Alvin. Thank you, everyone, for joining this session as well. Today's agenda would be access protection, basic understanding about access protection and how it works, access protection rules, exploit prevention, basic understanding about exploit prevention and how it works, and exploit prevention signatures. I will be taking you through access protection and my colleague Hasib will be go taking through exploit prevention in the later part of this session. Let me explain about uh, access protection feature. This is an optional feature which can be enabled provided the environment requires it. Let's quickly check on the overview of access protection feature. Access protection allows you to define access control policies and settings for processes, files, and directories. By restricting access to specific files and directories, you can protect your systems from vulnerabilities. Before we head to the access protection policies, let me uh, just inform you that uh, this session would be more of uh, an interactive type rather than the theoretical one. I will be showing each and every option of uh, the policy access protection policies in EPU as well as on a standalone system. This would make it uh, easy for us to understand and follow the instructions as well. Okay, as part of access protection policies, following settings can be specified. You can either enable or disable access protection. You can add exclusion and create rules for Linux platform. Now let us look into the Linux rules option. Linux rules option will have a name and an action which includes block only, report only, or either block and report. These Rules can be specified for executables, username, that would be the Linux user, and creation of sub rules. So, what does Linux sub rule options include? So, a Linux sub rule will have a name, a sub rule type, which will include either file or processes. So basically it protects files and directory and protects the specified process in the access protection rule. The file operations include creation of a file, deletion of a file, execution of a file, changing permission of a file, read of a file, renaming of a file, write to a file, hard link or creating a symlink and 
changing of ownership and the process operation include termination of a process or execution of a process or a run i will be explaining more about this in the apo console so that it is easier for us to understand each and every step i have already logged into the apo screen let me navigate to system tree the group and the assigned policies tab here and i select the default assigned access protection rule as we have seen we can either enable access protection add exclusion and create rules let me show what are the rules options available for linux platform so when i click on the linux platform and click the add button i get this option i get a space to enter the name here the action either to block or report or choose both and i need to specify the executable where i click add specify a name for the sub rule and i specify the process name here this is option you can add a notes to it similarly i can also specify the linux username in this field by clicking on the add button and providing the name of the linux user here now i have the sub rule where i can configure it by adding the add button under sub rules so as i had shown in the presentation you have an option to provide a name for the sub rule and the sub rule type would be either file or process so for file we have the following operation that would be create delete execute change permission read rename write hard link sim link change owner so any violation will be detected blocked and reported in a policy orchestrator similarly for processes we have the following operation terminate and run so when you run a specified process in the access protection rule that will not be permitted and will will be reported in a policy orchestrator we will be creating a sample rule in the uh, in the coming uh, uh, presentation and we'll be able to identify the event that is generated in e policy orchestrator as well and on the local system you can use command to check whether access protection is enabled or you can either enable or disable access protection so the path of mftp cli would be slash opt slash mcafe slash ens slash tp slash bin slash mfe tp cli and the command to check the status of access protection would be get ap status so it shows that access protection is enabled here if you want to disable access protection you can use the same mftp cli option and issue the command set ap is status disable and now if you check the status it will show us access protection is disabled we will go ahead and enable access protection by issuing the enable command sorry right, there should be a space there aps enabled and just to verify get uh, usually get ap status command so access protection is enabled here all right now we have confirmed that 
access protection is enabled both from e-policy orchestrator and from the standalone system. Now we'll go ahead and create access protection rules and validate them as well. So from APO, I'll be creating two rules. The first one will block any action that is due to change the permission of a file using the chmod command. The second one would be block an executable file. And in this case, I'm using the binary touch. In the later part, I'll be explaining everything on the APO screen. Same way, these rules can be created locally as well if uh, the system is not managed by a policy orchestrator. So here the command will be entirely different from what we do it in a policy orchestrator. And here also we use the same MFETP CLA option to create the rule. So just to view it, this would be the rule. So what we are doing is using MFETP CLI, creating a rule, providing a rule name. We are enabling reporting as well as block, adding a sub rule, and the operation will be change permission. And we are including the target file and a temp folder. The file name would be test. The second one will be block execute rule, which will be blocking execution of any operation using the touch command. In this case, it will be creating a file using the touch command. So the rule will look something like this, okay, using the same MFETP CLI. We are creating a rule. Same as the above rule, we are reporting as well as enabling block. We have a sub rule. The operation will be execute. That is to block and report execution and include the target file or the process touch. Okay, now let us go ahead and create access protection rule from a policy orchestrator. So I'm navigating to system tree. Click on the uh, assigned policies and the default policy that is assigned to my organization. I navigate down and select the Linux platform and click on the add button to create the rule. I provide a name, say change permission and I set the action to both block and report. Now I'm adding the executable. You can provide any arbitrary name here. And you will include the chmod process or the binary. Click on save here. Then you need to define the sub rule. So I click on add and select file as the specification here and provide a name. The operation here would be change permissions. And I'm including a target and the temp with the file name called test1. Click save, save the sub rule, save to save the rule. And you're saving the policy. Now we'll go ahead and issue a quick backup call to the agent 
so that it collects the newly created access protection rule. We can check the server task log and confirm whether the agent wake up is successful. It's still in progress. Meanwhile, we can check the local terminal as well. We can issue a CMD agent command to collect and send properties from EPU, and the command would be sorry. This command will collect and send properties to EPO. Let us confirm from EPO. Right. Okay. So the agent wake up is successful. Now let's check whether the rule has been registered in the database of endpoint security Linux. So the command to check the AP rule would be get all AP rule. So at the bottom you find something called user defined rules. So whatever rules that we create are user defined. There are other McAfee defined rules or presently Trellix enabled rules which cannot be deleted but can be modified. Now then the change permission rule is created. Let's validate this rule. So as you would have uh, 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 as you remember I had created and included a file name under temp path. So let's check whether the file is available there. So I do not have the file under temp folder. So I'll create the file using the touch command. This one. Now it is available. Now I am going to use the chmod command to change the permission. So here you get the output or rather an error stating the permission is denied. Which means that the access protection rule is violated. This, this can be confirmed from the MFE TPD log which is available in the local system. So the location of MFE TPD log will be slash var rather we will cat the log. So the path would be slash var McAfee ENS log TP MFE TPD log and just to get an easier output we can grep using the rule name. So here we can find the activity recorded or the violation recorded in MFE TPD log. The process name is chmod has violated the rule change permission for the file test one under temp folder. Now we will go ahead and send this event to ePolicy orchestrator using the cmd agent command. In the later part, we will see the 
validation in EPO and what event uh, IDs are generated for access uh, uh, protection violation. Okay, now let's create the second rule which will not allow touch to create any file on the Linux server. So I click on system tree, navigate to the assigned policy, select the default policy assigned to my organization, scroll down, select the Linux platform here. And click on the add button to create the rule. I, I give a temporary name here, create file, and set action to block and report. And directly I go to the subrule section here and select process and I give a, a name an arbitrary name for this sub rule so the operation here will be execution or run and I will have to specify the process here For this sub rule, I will be providing any any arbitrary name, and will include the touch binary. Click save to save the sub rule. and we will save the policy. We'll go ahead and issue a agent wake up. Just to confirm it from the server task log. It's in progress. Meanwhile, on the local system, we are sending in collecting properties. Let me clear the screen. Let's check it now. Task log. Okay, so the agent wake, wake up is completed. So the agent would have received the newly created access protection rule. We'll go ahead and confirm the same. So the command would be get all AP rules. Okay, as you can see here. The create file rule has been registered. Let's validate the scene. So I'm going to use the touch command and create a test file test.txt. So I get the permission denied error here. Let's check locally here and as mentioned. We'll go ahead and cat MFE TPD log from the following location. And we can grab using the rule name. So this is the violation that has been recorded in MFE TPD log.
So as we uh, did the last time, let's send this event as well to EPO using the CMD agent command. Anyway, at each every uh, each and every uh, policy interval or uh, the ASCII communication interval, the events will be sent to e, e policy orchestrator. We are doing it here manually. Now then, we have created the rule from a policy orchestrator and validated, and also we have checked the uh, logs lo locally, and the violation was recorded. Now we'll go ahead and check the same uh, rule from the local system on how to create the rule and validate the same. Before uh, creating the rule, let us go ahead, uh, go ahead and delete the rule from e policy orchestrator. So again, I navigate to system tree. Assign policies. The default access protection rule. So I find two rules here, which we had created earlier. Just click on it and hit the delete button. Similarly, for create file and hit the delete button. Click on save. Let's issue agent wake up. Also confirm whether the agent wake up is successful from server task log. It's still in progress. Meanwhile, let's check whether any event is generated in threat event log. Yes, 1092. This is the event ID that is generated when an access protection violation is detected. So here we use the touch command to create a file and the event category would be process violation or process class or access. The event ID will be 1092 and the threat action taken will be blocked. There is one more event ID 1095 where it would show that the action taken was would block that is only reporting is selected on the access protection action section. Okay, now let us check whether the agent wake up is complete. It's completed. We'll confirm the same from the local terminal as well. So the command would be get all AP rules. Yes. So here you see only Mac FA defined rules registered, no user defined rules. So previously we had the, uh, seen the rule uh, in the presentation. I have just copied the same rule here to a notepad. I'm going to paste it in the terminal window to create the rule. Sorry for that. So what does the rule say? It is creating a rule with a rule name called rule change permission with report enable, block enable. We have a sub role type and the operation is change permissions, which includes a target file slash temp test one. I'm hitting enter here. And the access protection rule was successfully created. Let's confirm it by running the get all AP rules command. So here the rule change permission, access protection rule is created and the block status is enabled report status is also enabled so let us validate if i do a ls here i see a test one file so 
the file is available and now i use the ch font 777 the file name to change the permission of the file i get the permission denied message again which confirms that the ch mod uh, binary has violated the access protection rule that we have created the same will be recorded in the mfe tpd log which you can confirm the rule name here is rule change permission Sorry, it's my mistake. Voila. So here we get it. The threat is recorded, and the rule for created locally is also working, and we have validated the same. Similarly, there is another rule for the touch process the first one was for file violation the second one is for process so i'm going to copy this and I'm going to create the access protection rule locally hitting enter okay the access protection rule was created successfully now i'm going to confirm the same using the get all ap rule It's here the rule executes with block and report enabled. Let's validate this. I'm going to use the touch command to create a file permission denied. Maybe I can create another file. Permission denied. Let us confirm from the MFE TPD log. Again, I'll use the rule name. Okay, so we validated two times and the violation is recorded twice. Rule name is rule execute and the process that violated is touch. Let's send this events to EPU using the CMD agent command so that we can actually verify the event IDs in a policy orchestrator. So, as I mentioned previously, there is also one more event ID 1095. Maybe I can go ahead and modify this uh, rule that uh, we created just a while ago. I will set block to disable. And then I, oh sorry, I have to change the rule name. One moment, rule execute one. I am setting report to enable, block to disable. Now I will I'll go ahead and delete the first rule. Otherwise, I will not be able to use the touch command to create the file to validate the event ID in a policy orchestrator. So, to uh, the command to delete the access protection rule locally would be delete AP rule with the index number. So first thing we will get the index number using the get all AP rules. So this is the rule that we want to delete and the index number is 6. So we use the command 
delete AP rule and the index number which is 6. The rule is deleted. Let's check using the get all AP rules. So the rule execute is already deleted and we have the new, new one created which is only for reporting. Now I'll go ahead and create a file using the touch command. And when I list out, it should be available. Yes, I've got the test2.out out, out, uh, file created in the temp folder. Again, I'll go ahead and send this event to McAfee eProxy Orchestrator. All right, now we'll go ahead and confirm the event that are generated in a policy orchestrator. So previously as mentioned, event ID 1092, the action would be block and the next event ID 1095, the action is not blocked but reported in a policy orchestrator. We'll go ahead and check this in a policy orchestrator. Okay, in APO, when we check threat event log, we should find 1092 as well as 1095. Yes, it is available. So 1095, the action would be would block. So this is the rule that we created locally. Similarly, 1092 that we had seen previously as well, 1092, the action taken would be blocked. Uh, coming to the common issues, the first thing is access protection cannot be enabled. So the cost here would be unsupported kernel modules, kernel modules aren't signed in a secure boot environment and presence of multiple versions of the same kernel version that was caused due to an incorrect uninstallation of uh, the previous version during upgrade. So these are the common issues. To check all this, you can always refer to KB article 87073, the supported uh, uh, total, uh, Platforms for uh, Input Security Linux. These are the uh, few other uh, KB articles that are uh, available. And for uh, the new release of kernel versions, you can always check the release notes of the latest version of ENSLTP. Thank you from my end. I will hand it over uh, to Haseeb who will take us through exploit prevention. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alvin. Hi, everyone. I'll be talking about exploit prevention for Linux and its functionality. Exploit prevention helps to protect our machines from exploits or vulnerabilities by restricting access to few specific processes, files, and directories. This is done with the help of exploit prevention content. A content contains signatures that is designed to detect specific exploits. Let's say a zero day malware has a specific type of file level exploit that it uses to gain access to a machine. If this vulnerability is covered by our expert prevention module, the machine can be protected from infection, even though it's an unknown malware. Contents are released whenever we discover an exploit that could be mitigated using our expert prevention module. The content release may contain single or multiple signatures. Currently, there are around 33 signatures available under expert prevention and all are configured to prevent file and process type exploit. HIPS, we had a legacy product called HIPS, which had same functionality of exploit prevention. HIPS is currently discontinued and exploit prevention is its successor. While HIPS or HIPS was a separate product, Expert prevention is part of our endpoint security threat prevention module. 
Let's talk about limitation. As we know, every product tend to have limitations and our expert prevention is not an exception. Unlike Windows, expert prevention for Linux is supported only on an environment that is managed by an EPO and not on a standalone machine. While Windows has a functionality where a user could create their own custom rules called expert rule, it is not available for Linux. Up next, we would see the expert prevention settings. Here we would look into the requirements followed by policy settings, exclusions, how to add them, and list of all available signatures in our EPO. For our expert prevention to work properly, we need to make sure we have few extensions that are loaded onto the EPO. The first one would be endpoint security for Linux license, followed by the platform and threat prevention extension. We'd also need to make sure we have the latest expert prevention Linux content, which is 10.7.0.00229 for now. If it is not updated, you can do a pull now task. This is a one time task. Here you could select all the packages or a particular content. Next, once you do a start pull, it will run the job. You can also schedule the task so that you can pull the packages every once in a while. Or then you need to click on new task. Give a name to it. Go next. The action should be repository pull. You can either choose all packages or select the exact package that you need. I will choose endpoint security expert prevention content for Linux. Go next. Here's a schedule which can be run hourly, daily, weekly, monthly. I can do yearly. This will start today and there's no end date. Next would be the summary. Once you save it, this will run. Next, let's go to the policy catalog to see our export prevention policy settings. Here you could see the option to enable and disable the module. You could see a label that says Windows and Linux only. This would be empty if we don't have our endpoint security Linux license extensions loaded. These are all for the Windows. Here are the exclusions. I've already added a few. To add the exclusion, we need to go and click on Add. We need to choose the Linux file and process. Give a name to it. It could be for Oracle. We can use wildcards here as well. Save it. Next, we would see the signatures. Here you can see that we have around 33 signatures loaded. I've enabled a few of them for testing. I've unchecked the option Windows, which will list only the Linux signatures here. As you can see that our signatures are based on only file and process type exploit. That's all for Windows. So once we save this, this saves our policy, move to our next agenda, which should be, we will run few commands on our terminal. The first command would be mfetpcli hyphen version. This will show us the version of endpoint security along with the version of the expert prevention content on the machine. Next would be get ep status, which will show the status of expert prevention. Using set EP status, enable or disable, we can uh, switch to any one of the state. Next would be MFTP CLI, get all EP signatures. 
this will list all the signatures available on the client. Up the last would be our get EP exclusions, which will list all the exclusions on the machine. Let's jump to our client machine. We will start with our first command, which is sudo apt McAfee DNS TP bin MFA TP CLI heaven hyphen version. You can see the version of endpoint security 10714, which is the latest, along with the DAT engine and the content version at the last. Now let's go ahead and check the status of our exploit prevention. The command would be get EP stay thus. It says disabled. I had disabled it already using my command line. Let's enable this. Using this command set EP status to enable. It says it's enabled. Let's check the status again using get EP status. You can see it's enabled. The next would be we'll look into the signatures available on the client. The command would be get all EP signatures. These are the signatures available. You could see what are enabled, what are disabled. And then we'll look into our exclusions. Using the command get EP exclusions. These are the list of exclusions that we could see on the on our client. Now let's go back to our presentation. Next would be our validation where we can also check if the rules are working or not. I will do this by triggering a couple of our signatures manually. And below is the KB 93977 that contains the steps to do so. Let's get back to the machine. I'll be clearing the screen. The command to First, bigger uh, one of our signature would be sudo touch watch fog. Here we get the output. Now let's see our log, which will be at the mfatpt.log. Let's do a sudo cat into it. This is the location of our log. Now you could see that one of our rule got triggered, which is 50001. Now let's trigger one more rule. So the command would be sudo touch run your dev dot pid. This doesn't return any output, but when we see the log, we should see the trigger. Here we can see there's a trigger for the signature 50030. Uh, let's talk about the common issues. Exploit prevention could remain disabled, and this could be due to secure boot. Secure boot prevents our endpoint security drivers from loading into the machine, and this could be fixed by disabling it or by signing our threat prevention kernels. 
The steps to perform this is mentioned in the KB 90085. Kernel compatibility issues. When the kernel running on a client machine is not supported, the threat prevention drivers will not get loaded as well. This could be fixed once the support for that particular kernel is added or by downgrading to a previous kernel, which is supported. You may encounter a lot of false positives. This could be mitigated by using proper exclusions for file and process types. Sometimes all of our signatures may not reflect onto our client. This is due to an outdated content installed on the client machine. Once we update the content on the client, we will see all the signatures loaded on the machine. Let's look into it on our Linux client. This machine is running exploit prevention content version 10.7.0.0.0.0.7.9, which is an older version. Now, if I run the command to see all the signatures, we would see only few signatures getting loaded. Get this. There are around six signatures that got loaded here, while the other machine, which has the proper content, has all the 33 signatures loaded. With this, I would like to conclude the session for today. Thank you everyone for joining. Over to you, Nick. Thanks, Awan and Asib. As a reminder for everyone, Trellix Education Services offers exceptional training to go along with our award-winning products. If you would like to learn more, please visit the website listed on your screen to see all of our offerings. Now let's get our Q&A session started. I see we have several questions, but it's not too late to add your question. Please type it in the Q&A window to submit. Additionally, take a moment to fill out the survey. Your feedback and suggestions are always appreciated. Uh, I'm a Linux admin and I do not use any specific product related commands. Is there any way to check if access protection is enabled from an OS perspective? Mm, yeah, that's a good one. You know, uh, Linux admins play with the OS command. Yes, and the NSLTP loads this access protection module to the kernel when enabled. And you can use LS mod uh, to confirm this. The module name will be something starting with MFE underscore AAC and the version number of the kernel update package. So you can use LS mode and grep uh, using MFE hyphen AAC to check the access protection, whether it is enabled or not. But uh, you know, uh, MFE AAC is uh, the module that is also being used by exploit prevention. So I would suggest you to use more granular product command using MFE TPCLI, get AP status command. Got it, okay, perfect. Thank you for that one. Can we block the use of external devices using access protection? Oh, unfortunately not at this uh, moment because uh, access protection does not work on a device driver level. Got it, okay, perfect. Thank you for that one. Uh, does disabling access protection cause any threats? You know, disabling access protection does not cause a security loophole as such. Access protection is an optional feature and it can be, or uh, the purpose of it can be leveraged depending on the security requirement of the environment to protect uh, violations on file, folder, or processes. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that one. Uh, is it possible to block certain users or groups from creating or modifying files at a particular directory or folder? Absolutely, yes. Access protection rule can be defined for Linux user and the target or directory can be specified or configured so that uh, the violation uh, can be detected. Got it. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that one as well. It just looks like that's all the questions that we had for today's session. I want to thank everyone for joining today's webinar and a big thank you to our speakers, Sisib and Alwyn. As a reminder, a link to today's recorded presentation will be emailed to all registered attendees. This concludes today's webinar. Stay safe, everyone.